one of the things that's become clear over the years is that it's extremely important to this, this synthetic community that we have, we have tried to create and then recreate to, to meet and hear from, to learn both from the, the substance of the ideas and the model of professionalism that is embodied by the experienced engaged scholars of our field. And by engaged scholars, I mean simply people who do scientific work of the highest quality, who are committed to students, and who also have had real effects, real engagements with the places where important decisions about the future of the intellectual property system is made, the courts, the committee rooms, the legislatures, and so forth. And we are today uh, overflowing in the, the, the range and quality of the examples of engaged scholarship that are presented by our wonderful panelists. And I'm going to do something a, a, a little bit backward, and that is before I introduce the topic of our symposium, I would like to introduce the participants in, 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 in brief, but in a way that I hope is, is, is uh, adequate to suggest their accomplishments. And the first person I need to introduce is my friend and collaborator in creating this symposium, Irene Calvely, who will be leading the discussion after the initial presentations. Irene is a professor of law at Texas A&M and also helps direct the Applied Research Center for Intellectual Assets and the Law in Asia at the Singapore Management University School of Law, where she has also taught for many years. She has a wide range of scholarly interests in areas such as, but by no means limited to, trademark law and the law of geographical indications. She's published widely in English and Italian, and recently she's co-edited two terrific volumes, Diversity and Intellectual Property, and Geographical Indications at the Crossroads of Trade, Development, and Culture. I am in, in these introductions, by the way, mainly going for, for books because there are so many of them. Articles too numerous to name. Let us let us specify that. And now I will go in alphabetical order and introduce Professor Jeremy De Beer from the University of Ottawa's Faculty of Law, who is a co-founding director of the Open Air Innovation Research Network, Open Air, and was an extremely important feature factor in the organization of a previous global congress, which was held in Cape Town a few years ago. He also helps lead an interdisciplinary group on rethinking intellectual property and open innovation. He is a, is a seasoned advocate as well as a widely published scholar. And his most recent book is Innovation and Intellectual Property, Collaborative Dynamics in Africa. Susan Sell who is, is, is back in town, and I am delighted for that because for many, many years, Susan was an, an essential colleague when she taught political science and directed a research center at our crosstown rival, Georgetown University. She's now a RegNet professor at the Australian National University, and her research interests include international political economy, Trade, Economic Development, Intellectual Property, and Investment. Her books include the, the indispensable private power, public law, and the globalization of intellectual property rights, which in a sense I think was the, 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 really the, the source of a whole line of discourse which continues, I'm happy to say, down to the present day. And it is a, a special honor, therefore, to have her back with us. We have... Jerome Reichman, who is the Brian S. Womble Professor of Law at Duke and 
has written, lectured widely on a range of topics, especially, but not exclusively, <laughs> topics relating to the, the nexus between intellectual property law and international trade, and especially, I think, an, an area in which he has been a, a, a teacher and, and, and leader to all of us in the questions relating to uh, implementation and implementation flexibilities under the TRIPS agreement. And he has a new book with Keith Maskus, International Public Goods and the Transfer of Technology Under a Globalized Intellectual Property Regime. Margaret Chun is, is, is an old and good friend of the, the Pidgeot program, and it is wonderful that she was able to join us again for this occasion. She's, she's, she's been on the faculty at University of Seattle since 1996, and she teaches and, and writes in the, in, at the, the interface between intellectual property and critical theory. She's currently the, Din, the and I have to get it right, Donald and Linda Horowitz Professor for the Pursuit of Justice, which is, I think, just about the best academic title I can imagine having. Uh, again, you have to put scholar articles to one side because there are so many, but there is a brand new book. Can you show it? And it's wonderful because I know a little about it. The Cambridge Handbook on Public-Private Partnerships, Intellectual Property Governance, and Sustainable Development. It will be clear by now that the, the, the expertise and the areas of engagement for many of our panelists are around trade and governance issues as they relate to intellectual property in particular. Margot Bagley agreed to make this trip, and I'm so grateful to her. She's the Asa Griggs Chandler, Chandler Professor of Law at Emory, um, and was before that at University of Virginia. She has a long-standing teaching affiliation with the Max Planck Institute in Munich as well. And she's an expert technical advisor to nation states, including Mozambique, at the World Intellectual Property Organization, and a very, very for important factor in the ongoing work of the WIPO Intergovernmental Committee. She writes about both domestic and comparative issues relating to patents and biotechnologies, access to medicine, technology transfer. And with our other panelist, Ruth Akedeji, she has several new books, including Patent Law in Global Perspective, which brings me to Ruth, who is the Jeremiah Smith Jr. Professor of Law at Harvard's Law School and co-director of the Berkman Klein Center working on intellectual property and social and economic development, a lot of work on access to knowledge, a lot of work on access to essential medicines, and issues relating to indigenous innovation systems. She's advised governments, intergovernmental organizations, regional economic communities on a wide range of issues. And her most recent book, apart from the co-authored volume I just named, is copyright law in an age of limitations and exceptions, which I highly recommend. What a group. So uh, I don't want to take any more significant time before jumping into the program, except to say one thing about the choice of topic that we arrived at in conce conceptualizing this, this morning's foundation, uh, this morning's symposium. The broad topic, as you know, is intellectual property and development. And this topic occurred to us, to me and to Irene, because over the years that we have been doing this Global Congress over the even, even longer period of time over in which we have been following this debate, uh, we've been struck by the the wide variety of ways in which the, that relationship, the IP development relationship, has been figured, has been portrayed. Uh, in, in relation to development goals, IP has been, depending on the point of view of the speaker, 
characterized as, as anything from a, a panacea to a peril with, with, in, with all points in between. And we thought that it might be interesting to try to uh, collect a set of somewhat more nuanced interventions on the, the nature of that relationship. And so we invited this extraordinarily distinguished panel to address that topic in any way and according to, to anything in a thematic that, that they chose. We have been abetted in all of this by the staff of the WCL International Law Review. Is there anyone here from the Law Review? You, they deserve they deserve a hand, and we're hoping that before too long, some of the contributions that you hear today will be represented in various ways in a forthcoming issue of the Law Review. So thank you all very very much. The 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 review has really made this possible. And now let me tell you what the the format we have in mind is. Everybody, each person is going to talk for ten minutes, um, and I'll. I'll play timekeeper and, and try to be a, a both, both sort of uh, authoritative and kind at the same time. Not an, not an easy straddle in some cases. And when, when we have heard from our panelists then, because it's a symposium, we will have some conversation among ourselves. At that point, I think I'll invite everybody up to sit at the front table. For now, you can... You can, you can come up one by one. And Irene will kick off that discussion. And then I hope we'll have time for a broader talk among ourselves. We have a nice, long block of time. So I say, let's take advantage. And I think um, going in, in strict order that I will ask Jeremy to go first. So let's see, where do you where do you want to be? Why don't you go to the to the end there? Uh, in case there is any need or need or reason and I will sit. I will sit. I have to say um, that when uh, when Peter and Irene asked me to participate in this panel, I was blown away. I didn't feel, and I still don't feel like I belong on the panel of distinguished academics, given the fact that my other panelists are uh, are all of the people who have written my references for <laughs> tenure and promotion and uh, research grant applications. And so it's a, it's an incredible honor uh, to, to join this panel. Thanks for the invitation and opportunity to do that. I'd like to uh, speak about uh, slightly different vision for intellectual property and development than we've been working on and talking about for the last uh, four go global congresses. And I'm going to try to um, make the case today that um, we need to move beyond a discourse that's dominated by openness to an approach that focuses more on inclusion. And the reason I think that is because I believe that the approach that focuses on openness and limitations and exceptions and flexibility has left behind vast segments of the human population. And that it's not enough for us to just say that we need more opportunities for access to knowledge in the global knowledge governance system. We need to start working toward much more active, positive steps to guarantee inclusion in the global knowledge governance system. So what I'm saying, simply put, is that the opportunities to participate in the global knowledge system through openness is not enough. We need to take positive steps to include more uh, segments of the population globally that have been excluded and marginalized by the current approach. So I'd like to just talk uh, very briefly about some, some of the development theory background um, that leads to where, where I want us to go as a community. I'd like to talk about some specific problems and highlight some areas where I think we have work to do, and we're doing great work, but we can do more. 
and then conclude with some action items and strategies uh, to go forward. So w we know th how the theory around uh, development in general has evolved from an approach concentrating on economic growth as the key objective for uh, development policy, not only the key objective, but the key indicator or metric of how we understand success or failure in our development policy objectives. We've moved away from that, I think, quite clearly. All of us uh, in this room who are interested in IT and development work um, far more comfortably within the frameworks uh, created by Sen and Nasmaum around uh, development as freedom and development as capabilities. But I would like to challenge us to move one step further, consistent with what I was saying a few minutes ago about um, opportunity not being enough. I, I'm worried that if all we say is let's provide the freedom to um, the freedom to participate in the global knowledge economy, or the um, capability to do so, that's not enough. That doesn't guarantee that people will take advantage of that or be able to realize those opportunities um, and to take advantage of the capabilities. So I think we need to go one step further um, and, th and reframe development as a positive um, right to inclusion as opposed to a mere opportunity uh, to have the freedom to participate or the capability to participate. We need to find ways to guarantee that. Uh, why do I think that's important? Well, one reason is I think it's a, a moral imperative that we do that. But I also think it's, even if you're uh, only uh, focused on self-interest, I think it's a smart thing to do um, to ensure that more people can participate in the knowledge economy worldwide. Let me give you some specific concrete examples of areas I think that's important. Um, one of the places where the debates about intellectual property and technology collide most closely is in high-tech and R&D driven areas, biomedical field, pharmaceutical uh, R&D, the digital economy, um, and moving forward into areas like artificial intelligence. This is something that we're all talking about. This is where formal intellectual property rights have a great role to play. And much of our conversation has been focused on limitations and exceptions and flexibilities in these fields. But I'm going to suggest that we need to pay far more attention to Sustainable Development Goal 5, gender equality and empowerment of women and girls in this field. So merely focusing on uh, flexibilities and um, uh, limitations and, and access isn't enough to change some very problematic statistics. So uh, as of 2015, 29% of patent applications have a woman listed as an inventor. That's up from 17% in 1995, but it's definitely not good enough. Not only are only 29% of patent applications um, listing a woman as an inventor or a co-inventor, men are more likely than women to have their patent application granted unless the examiner cannot identify the gender of the inventor from the name. So um, if you're interested, I'll share some of the uh, sources of this, this data. WIPO's done some great work. There was a study just published in uh, Nature Biotechnology by some Yale researchers that start to document these problems. And it's not just in patents. Now, copyright data is harder to track, but we know that 7% uh, of directors are women, 20% of screenwriters. In the United States, men are twice as likely um, to register copyright protection than women. So if all we do is focus on limitations and exceptions um, and access to knowledge, I don't think that we're really addressing this uh, core aspect of, um, of, of inequality and, and, and inclusion. So I, I think in the high-tech area, we need to do much more there. Another area I think that um, we fail to achieve our goals of inclusion and inclusive developments in the informal sector. In Sub-Saharan Africa, 63% of gross value added comes from the informal sector. In India, the number is 51%. In Latin America, the number is 26%. The informal sector is an enormously significant contributor, not only to the economy and to jobs throughout the developing world, but it's an integral part of uh, the social fabric and cultural life. Now, we've had some great studies done um, by members of the, of the Global Congress uh, community. I'm thinking of Kara study in particular on piracy and emerging economies. 
the narrative that, that, that's out there amongst policymakers is that the informal economy is full of intellectual property infringers and that the key to economic development is simply to formalize the informal sector. I don't think that's the answer at all. I think the informal sector is a hotbed of innovation, but the kinds of innovations being produced are not the kinds of innovations that are measured adequately by patents or trademarks or copyrights. And so we need a much more nuanced approach to say how can we make an intellectual property or more accurately knowledge governance system work uh, to include people who um, live and, and work in the informal sector. Um, a, a third area I think we need to do much more work around inclusion and inclusive um, vision of, of IP and development is in respect of indigenous and local communities. Uh, yesterday, I was um, uh, watching or listening to one of the panels, and um, the case was made that, uh, that traditional knowledge and intellectual property rights are just so fundamentally incompatible that we ought not even discuss this. And uh, actually, the point that was uh, more strongly put was that the discourse around traditional knowledge is actually very harmful to actors in other parts of the intellectual property debate, and the argument was made by one of the panelists that, um, that in the area of access to medicines, for example, the discourse around traditional knowledge protection is highly problematic. I fundamentally disagree um, with, with that. I think that we need a much uh, more nuanced and richer discourse in our community, the Global Congress community, around Indigenous innovation. Um, we have, I'm, I hope that we'll hear some more from people who've been working actively on this topic lately. Um, but I think we need to start from the realization that uh, Peter Dreosh and Susie Frankel wrote about in a book on indigenous innovation, that um, indigenous innovation is not, or traditional knowledge is not antiqu antiquated and, and stale and old, but it, it actually is innovative. The, the difference is traditional knowledge and indigenous innovation tends to be directed at the maintenance of systems rather than the creation of artifacts. And I think when we recognize that, we can understand better how to integrate that into a, a more inclusive uh, knowledge governance system. Um, I have some ideas on how we can do that, but I think maybe I'll leave that for the question period so I, I can keep time for the rest of the, the panelists. Uh, in short, I think we need more empirical research that connects um, the international and global governance framework with the on-the-ground realities in developing countries. I think that kind of empirical work and grounded theory building is really important. And I think we need to do much more action-based research with the communities affected by uh, the global IP system um, and that partnerships like and networks like the Global Congress has created is the way to do that. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. First of all, I want to thank um, Irene and Peter for including me in this very exciting panel. I'm very pleased and proud to be here. Um, and thank you all for showing up. Um, what I want to do today is talk about, I want to, um, I'm a political scientist by training. And what I want to talk about today is um, the relationship between intellectual property and the international investment regime. Um, and I also want to offer a bit more of a structural perspective or a view from 30,000 feet about contemporary capitalism and then um, some ideas about um, how to provide um, a better system for the sustainable development goals. Um, so the view from 30,000 feet, what's different about capitalism today versus just the neoliberal system? One of the differences, as John Quiggin, the Australian economist, mentions, is what we're living in today is what he calls financialized capitalism. In this sense, we're relying much more on the financial sector to steer the economy. Um, and what that means is we have an outsized role of intangibles in the economy. That means intellectual property, goodwill, which I'm not 100% sure what that is, uh, trademarks, um, uh, financial instruments, um, like collateralized debt obligations. Carl Polanyi would refer to these as fictitious commodities versus uh, late, or fictitious commodities versus products. So there's an outsized role of intangibles, and this has led to an increase in oligopoly power as well as monopsony power. So we're getting a really interesting and not very positive 
division of labor in the world now of those who control supply, global supply chains. And they control them through uh, intangibles, through intellectual pro ownership of intellectual property, through financial instruments. And this means that there's concentrated wealth by the owners of these intangibles. And there's intense competition lower down on the supply chain for those who are actually producing the products. Or, you know, Foxconn making iPads is a perfect example of that, where the Chinese get $25 for a $300 iPad. So Apple is really, you know, controlling the intellectual property and also getting most of the rents. So there's this intense competition at the bottom, but at the top there's increasing concentration, and that's led to increasing inequality both across countries but also within countries. Um, and so there's connections between global finance, intellectual property, um, in, in investor state dispute settlement, and transnational enterprises. What we've seen across these areas is a shift in power to the private side, where the private sector gets all the rights and no obligations, and the public sector has all the obligations and gets none of the rights. So this shift has taken place over a period of time, and we're seeing negative effects of that now. Um, and there is um, there are a lot of behaviors that these uh, firms and owners of the intangibles engage in that does promote inequality. They avoid paying taxes. They're not paying their fair share of taxes in the communities in which they operate. Um, they're spurring labor competition and low wages. Um, there's really not very much technology transfer going on. Um, and this has become an important issue even in the global north. It's not a north-south issue at all. Um, Case and Deaton, two economists at Princeton, have been writing lately about deaths from despair. And in fact, among white males in America with, with no college education and a lack of economic opportunity, uh, life expectancy is actually going down. Um, and these deaths of despair involve opioid overdoses, alcoholism, et cetera. So something is really rotten. This is not, the system is not working for people. Um, and so relating now to intellectual property in particular, I want to talk about the invest, investment state dispute settlement. I've been following intellectual, I'm old and there's advantages to that. So I've been following intellectual property for a long, long time. And what I see is there's increasing uh, stalemate at multilateral levels. Property rights owners don't want to negotiate things openly or uh, multilaterally. And so um, they're finding other ways, though, to promote enforcement and expansion of their rights. And to me, investor state dispute settlement, and uh, Rochelle Cooper-Dreyfus and Susie Frankel have written very compellingly about this, are now taking a very capacious definition of what, in, what constitutes an investment asset, and intellectual property now is considered to be an investment asset. And I see this as the camel's nose inside the tent. This is another uh, pioneering area for rights owners to push for their, for their rights in ISDS cases. Um, and this has negative effects for development, negative effects for policy space. Now, so far, there have been three very prominent cases showing how this can create a regulatory chill or you know, being uh, sued by a private company for government policies or regulations. We have the very famous Uruguay case for the, uh, against Philip Morris. We have the Australian case on plain packaging, also with Philip Morris. And then the patent case with Eli Lilly um, in Canada. Now, even though in each of these three cases, the rights holders did not prevail in the ISDS, the rul rulings in the Australian and Canadian cases were narrow enough that they do not prov provide any disincentive for rights holders to continue down this path. So I predict I have a lousy crystal ball, but this one I'm pretty sure about. There's going to be a lot more IP-related ISDS cases coming down the pike. In the case of Uruguay, it's important to keep in mind that they had someone come to the rescue. Michael Bloomberg funded their defense against Philip Morris, and a, some Swiss guy did. They, they, they paid, they bankrolled their defense. Now, to defend yourself in an ISDS case, it costs five times as much as it would for a WTO case. So imagine a country that doesn't have a white knight like Michael Bloomberg, or a very poor country 
they are likely to just cave in. And so this is a very big uh, problem for development, a challenge. Um, now, in the ISDS system, there's a lot of pushback right now. A lot of developing countries are saying no more, we're not going to sign anymore. There's a lot of innovation going on in terms of writing new uh, model laws. Uh, the Indian uh, model bit, uh, bilateral investment treaty of 2015, I think is very interesting because what they're doing explicitly is pushing back on intangibles. Only, the only things I'll count as investment is really you know, it's not a financial asset, it's not intellectual property, it's a factory, it's, it's a, a productive enterprise in some way. So this is a very interesting model to push back against the concentration of wealth and rent seeking among the intangibles. Um, and then there are a lot of debates and discussions about um, whether or not we should choose arbitrators more, you know, differently, should we have a European investment court, should we reopen the multilateral agreement on investment conversations? And just to be provocative, some of these are incremental reforms, and I wonder if they don't amount to just rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, because the system is not working. And it's, um, I'm not saying don't bother with incremental reform. I think the Indian model bit is a good start. Um, to push back against this new division of labor with the intangibles, getting all the rents and uh, the workers not. Um, but I think we need to ask that bigger structural question of whether this is just you know trying to patch a leaky bucket. Now the last thing I want to say, and this is a plug, and, and happy to brag about it because I'm not the author. This book um, came out of the uh, Center for Sustainable Investment at Columbia University. And it's a product of a book sprint, where I was one of the 14 authors. And uh, we wrote this book in five days. And the book is common, common, uh, Creative Commons license, so it's downloadable. Um, and it's for activists and regulators, how to realign the international investment regime with the sustainable development goals. And um, I will brag about it, because I think it's really great. Um, and I wasn't the sole author. I was one of 14. We were trapped in a hotel on Kent Island in the Chesapeake Bay in May for five days, 14, 16 hour days, a lot of post-it notes were involved, and everybody wrote every chapter. They didn't give us an outline, we had a two page concept note, we had someone cracking the whip who knew how to play insecure overachievers like a fiddle. <laughs> so um, anyway, it was a really awesome experience. I have some copies here. But it's fully downloadable. It's it's free. It's open source, um, and um, I go to get? I recommend it, huh? Where do we go to get? It? Well, I think you can. I have an ISBN number. I don't have a URL. Okay. Um, it's searchable. But it's totally searchable. It's called Rethinking International Investment Governance Principles for the Twenty First Century, and. Um, Anyway, so I think this is uh, something useful to rethink. And they have the features of the Indian model bit in there. Uh, the people that wrote it, I was only political scientist, but it was economists. There were people from all over the world. Um, economists, uh, a lot of lawyers, I'm used to that. Um, but at any rate, so um, that's my plug. And I think I'll just leave it there. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, there's the deal. Well, uh, thank you, Peter, for inviting me to this wonderful conference, and thanks to all of the organizers and participants. It's really a pleasure to, to be here. I did, it's on. Can't hear? Better? Okay, thanks to all the organizers and all the wonderful contributors. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about why the Marrakesh model for the visually uh, uh, impaired could facilitate access to cross-border supplies of patented pharmaceuticals. This is a topic dear to my heart. Uh, about 10 years ago, 
uh, Fred Abbott and I uh, uh, proposed that uh, uh, developing uh, countries should adopt pooled procurement uh, strategies for uh, a, a, a purpose of obtaining uh, pharmaceuticals across borders. And to this end, we advise them uh, to establish regional pharmaceutical supply centers that could help coordinate and manage this, uh, pool, these pooled procurement strategies. Now, since then, there are at least two important developments uh, that I think uh, support our uh, proposals. First, of course, is the fact that Article 31 bis of the TRIPS Agreement has become international law. Uh, uh, that means that uh, countries without uh, countries can issue uh, a compulsory license even though they do not have manufacturing capacity, and then they can apply to another country, say India or even the EU, with manufacturing capacity for a second compulsory license uh, for export only to the first country. That's Article 31 bis of the TRIPS Agreement, which is now uh, public international law. Uh, but the second important development uh, for my purposes is the, the Marrakesh Treaty on facilitated access to uh, published literary works for the visually impaired. Because this has given us a concrete model that uh, uh, emulates and, and, and implements our model for cross-border supplies of uh, um, uh, 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 pharmaceuticals. So let me... Uh, uh, look a little uh, closer at that. Um, the, the, under the Marrakesh uh, uh, Treaty, um, uh, you have uh, the World Union of the Blind becomes the supplier of these uh, artifacts. Uh, uh, it's the authorized entity under the Marrakesh uh, Treaty, and it's authorized to uh, supply these artifacts to beneficiaries uh, uh, wherever they may be located. So uh, the really interesting thing about the Marrakesh Treaty is, is that uh, it doesn't require a compulsory license. Uh, now, it's important under TRIPS, we have the, the, the authority to suspend territoriality under uh, Article 31 bis. Uh, the way it's done in the Marrakesh Agreement uh, is not by compulsory license. It's a built-in limitation and exception that uh, countries adopt that allows the freedom to import and export these uh, ar uh, visual uh, artif these, uh, artifacts uh, from different countries. And uh, the, uh, the World Union of the Blind becomes the authorized entity that can supply uh, a whole global market uh, uh, w w without violating the territoriality principles. It has, the, under the treaty, you have the right to export and the right to import these artifacts for the blind. So you've set up a global market that, ca that suspends the territoriality principle, and you can, uh, uh, the World Union of the Blind can supply all those who need them in different, in different countries, which, uh, except for India, is usually a small market. India has about three, three million blind. But in other countries, it's a small market. But you put it all together, it becomes a big market, and you have a lot of bargaining power. And, uh, and the, uh, the, the World Union of the Blind becomes a trusted intermediary. Now, I think if we adopted that for our, uh, uh, to the, uh, adapted that to the uh, cross-border supply of, uh, uh, of um, uh, pharmaceuticals, I think it would really work. We, we would have these regional supply centers. Uh, they, what problem would they solve? You hear a lot of myth that uh, uh, Articles 31 of the TRIPS Agreement, which allows compulsory licensing, and Article 31 bis, which allows cross-border supplies of, of a compulsory license, that they're complicated. They are not complicated at all. They are as clear as can be in, in, in legal terms. What, uh, what, the problem is not that they're complicated. The problem is a coordination problem. Uh, you have to coordinate uh, internally. The government has to get its agencies in, in line to uh, uh, emit the compulsory license. And then you have to uh, coordinate uh, uh, in, in trans-border relations. One government has to agree with another co government to issue uh, the compulsory license and get another. Now, the myth is that the, the law, the reason the myth is that the law itself is complicated is that Canada's Enabling Act 
was <laughs> diabolically complicated because it was meant to discourage the whole thing. And that's the one example we have is Rwanda getting it from Canada. But uh, the NGOs kept telling Canada, no, don't do that. And they did it anyway. Uh, but the other, India's law is very simple. The, even the EU's law is very simple. And uh, the, the pharmaceutical companies in India are, are, are ready, willing, and able to uh, uh, implement uh, the cross-border supply if they're, if they're given the opportunity. So what we have is a coordination problem. And uh, uh, I think that now more than ever, um, the regional pharmaceutical supply center uh, idea that we put forward would uh, solve that problem. And uh, it stands now on the basis uh, it's supported by the Marrakesh Treaty, because the World Union of the Blind would become the author, the, uh, the, the, the supply centers would become the authorized entities. The beneficiaries would be uh, uh, the, the countries that need, uh, the, uh, uh, that need these supplies. And they would arrange for the, the, the uh, supply centers would do the work. And what's more, uh, they would uh, do the work in two ways. One, they would get the orders from the, the governments that they want, so they would have a lot of bargaining power. So even without issuing compulsory license, they would have the power to bring down the price uh, even below, uh, and encourage more than tiered pricing uh, practices, but really tiered pricing practices that we know the tiered practicing are not really working very well. But they would have a lot of bargaining power, and they would have the, the, the ability to threaten and issue the compulsory license. Licenses. And uh, really, uh, let me just uh, uh, add this one final thought. Um, I, I don't think it would be necessary to issue many compulsory licenses. Brazil is a very good example. Years ago, Delulo issued a, a, a compulsory license finally after threatening it again and again. And he, and he did it in a, in a, a closed circuit television that we could all watch. And uh, last week, Brazil issued another one. But it isn't that they're issuing them every day. Every day. The, one, uh, once in a while is enough to get the point that uh, you either come to an agreement on the price or will issue a compulsory license. A and uh, I think that would be the power of the, pool of the regional pharmaceutical centers. But they would have a lot of bargaining power to begin with. And I doubt that it would be necessary to issue many compulsory licenses because of this bargaining power. Uh, and on top of it, once they got started, I think the regional pharmaceutical supply centers uh, could um, actually uh, uh, help fund local production in uh, developing countries, which I think is the, the, the route of the future. Uh, more local production is needed, and I think we, I think we can do it. And I think the, this regional pharmaceutical supply centers would be, uh, could be a major uh, participator. So 10 minutes is not very much. Uh, so I will stop there. <laughs> and uh, OK. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you very much, Peter. So the names don't match the people. Just they will. They will. That that out the there. second part, we'll, we'll make sure. Okay. So can you hear me or not? Okay. Now. All right. Wonderful. So uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging what Peter said at the beginning about creating this wonderful intellectual community. Seeing so many of you here in this room who are participating in the construction of a really important set of. Uh, tools and sort of uh, different ways of pers different perspectives and ways of approaching intellectual property. For the students in the room, um, it's so great to see you as well. When I was a student many years ago, since I'm old as well as dear, uh, I also participated in our international journal. And I remember when I was a student really wanting to get involved in this area. And now it's such a pleasure and privilege to be part of this distinguished panel. So. Um, Professor Yazi or Peter um, invited us to engage in some blue sky thinking with regard to intellectual property and development. And so what I'm going to present to you is sort of half baked, but it's really sort of my invitation to the group to perhaps engage in 
some out-of-the-box thinking about what we mean when we talk about IP and development. And well, I want to acknowledge also that development itself, in quotation marks, is a highly fraught term. Uh, there's so many ways in which it really just does not capture what we're trying to get at with this conversation. And it's, it's very, it has a lot of colonial baggage. It has uh, embedded within it some uh, very deeply problematic enlightenment concepts of civilized versus primitive, et cetera. And sort of this idea of progression through you know, subsequent stages of improvement and sort of the white man's burden. Um, so I wanted to put that out there, but then um, address that by saying, well, that's sort of what we have as a container for thinking about possibly progressive approaches to IP. And uh, I had the pleasure of inviting Peter and, and carving a week out of his busy schedule, and maybe it was just two days, uh, a few years ago where he came to, to visit me in Seattle and we brainstormed on a possible project that we could do together, which I think might be actually starting to come together um, in the form of this group. And, and um, so I'm going to read to you a little bit of a, a draft book proposal that I put together after this meeting uh, where we um, went deeply into our thoughts about this. And, and then I'm going to sort of do more of a talk. The book proposal is really about intellectual property and global social justice. So I submit that when we talk about development, we're really talking about global and we're also talking about something about social justice, right? So intellectual property can be conceptualized as a field that consists of all ways of ordering knowledge systems, whether by precept or practice. This capaciousness or this capacious approach then points to a different ordering of domains than by the familiar and yet narrow schema of copyright, patent, and trademark laws, uh, the big three as well as some of the associated others. Going beyond these existing public law categories include, um, allows the inclusion of other things such as tacit knowledge transmission, private ordering mechanisms, and other forms of legal pluralism, including social norms. Um, so structuring the, this field in a way that emphasizes the major social welfare goals of ordering knowledge rather than by specific legal doctrines not only opens up the current doctrinal categories for significant analytical revisiting, but also invites consideration of emerging approaches, methodologies, and subjects of knowledge systems. Globalization, another key term, through both formal international trade agreements and informal transnational networks, which is something I've been writing about a lot lately, contributes to this reframing of the field of intellectual property. Increasingly insistent cross-border flows of information act as powerful disruptors of the territoriality of traditional intellectual property doctrinal categories. Um, and we know that the fair flow of information does not necessarily mean the free flow of information. Uh, and as Madhavi Sundar has pointed out, the free flow of information doesn't necessarily result in the fair flow. So, uh, and that's a point that I think Jeremy made in his opening talk that we need to think about inclusion um, and not just freedom. Attempts by state actors to harmonize disparate doctrinal rules highlight the cultural specificity of knowledge governance while providing partial dynamic comparative frames of analysis. Simultaneously, the insistent locality of many forms of knowledge production and distribution raise questions about the propriety, propriety of universal rule structures. Rather than focusing on the well-documented dialogical interplay between harmonization and resistance, a meta-focus on globalized intellectual property could instead examine recurring features of knowledge systems across regions, sort of a pattern analysis such as Pam Samuelson has done with fair use, but contextualize in the intersection of law, on, perhaps of law in the books and law in action. So the third possible sort of facet of this uh, three-legged approach would be social justice, which provides a further basis for restructuring the field of intellectual property through its lens of power relations of epistemological and material privilege among various knowledge system stakeholders. Uh, a social justice critique of liberal ideals of social welfare points to either redistributive 
or enabling views of justice. Again, something that I think that Jeremy was alluding to in his uh, earlier talk. Uh, these may conflict with or complement liberty enhancing views often dominant and progressive versions of intellectual property ideology, such as open source and so on. These disparate views of the role of intellectual property in a good life provide additional fulcrums for realigning the field towards broader questions about the nature of knowledge creation, production, distribution, and usage in knowledge systems. So we were thinking about the reordering of knowledge systems as a sort of larger project. Um, but then we had four buckets that we wanted to kind of think more deeply about. And those four buckets would be um, just tentatively boundaries, collaboration, innovation, and well-being. So I just want to say a few things about each of these four. With regard to boundaries, um, we know that there has been some very good IP scholarship on the boundaries of the firm done by people like Dan Burke and Peter Lee. Um, and we could really extend that and expand that to boundaries, not just of the firm, but also of with, with and among collaborative networks. And so Peter alluded to a book that was just published um, this month on public-private partnerships, uh, and there will be more on that later today. But I wanted to sort of point that out to sort of say that um, it's the collaboration between for-profit and not-for-profit uh, institutions not just firms, and the boundaries between them that are of high interest and high focus in that book. Competition policy obviously has a lot uh, to, to add to this um, category, as well as licensing and technology transfer, and a lot of the new scholarship on social licensing practices, patent uh, pledges, and so on uh, that contribute to this. Um, the second bucket would be collaboration. Um, and so by that, we often think about, we often go right to the idea of open source, open systems, openness, right? But I'd like to, again, complicate that a little bit by thinking about not just that or of co knowledge commons management, but of things like <coughs> boundary organizations and how that collaborative activity takes place across different partners uh, in these more complex types of knowledge creation. The third bucket, or the fourth bucket, is innovation. Um, and so we all can agree that uh, I think there's large, broad consensus across the ideological spectrum that IP is about innovation, right? That is its primary policy goal. But we could, again, break that down, I think, into things like what kinds of activities enable and foster entrepreneurship. We all know that there's a huge uh, gap between the idea and the commercialization of the idea. Uh, and yet that that fact on the ground does not is not taken into account in many of the ways in which we think about uh, innovation, um, including the informal economy, including effectiveness metrics that may or may not uh, be represented by the pure um, numerical value of patent filings. Uh, things that one of the authors in the book, Hilde Stevens, who's looked very closely at a public-private partnership in Europe, the IMI, the Innovative uh, Medicines Initiative. Um, and has concluded that uh, things like trade secrets, know-how, the tacit uh, knowledge transfer, um, even the trust and knowledge that is uh, uh, built up through the partnership relationship are ways in, in which we can actually and, and should be measuring the effectiveness of, of these innovation efforts. Um, the, the then we, we also talked about rights and tradition, which is something that Peter is very, very uh, interested in. And uh, these should include not just what we think of as traditional knowledge or traditional cultural expression, but also emerging, emergent traditions. And uh, I was very taken by um, the idea that, you know, indigenous innovation um, is, is something that is a dynamic uh, sort of process rather than something about artifacts. Um, the family and, and other units rather than just the state as sites of governance in, is included in that sort of approach. And the final, fourth and final bucket would be that of well-being. And so this is an obvious allusion to the human capabilities uh, sort of approach to intellectual property. But um, I'd, I'd submit that that's not enough to think about capabilities. We also need to put that in the context of relations of power from colonial to post-colonial sort of uh, structures. Um, and uh, think about how that impacts our current implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals and, and their focus on uh, poverty eradication, human flourishing, and human rights. 
So I'll just end uh, this very short, uh, brief intervention by sort of positing um, with my friends at, at AU, I've, I've attended a number of their gender and IP conferences, and one of the, uh, their former faculty members, Joan Williams, has written a lot about re what she calls reconstructive feminism, where uh, the differences between men and women, um, social constructs, are often measured against unexamined masculine norms. And so I would submit uh, that one way to think about differences within uh, our perceptions of, of development um, what's more developed or less developed are often uh, often measured against unexamined IP norms that we should all uh, be wary of. So, thank you. Good morning, and um, I also am just so delighted to be here. Thanks so much, Peter and Irene, and to be a part of this panel. I was sitting there thinking, like, when did I become a senior scholar? When did that happen? <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> but um, in terms of something that uh, Jeremy mentioned, he, he said he hoped that someone would talk about uh, TK and um, indigenous uh, peoples and local communities, and I'm going to do that a bit. So um, the title is Protecting Traditional Knowledge for Development. And it's, uh, okay, it's based on a couple of different projects that I'm working on right now. Um, one is uh, an, an article or an essay really on the, fa the fallacy of defensive protection for traditional knowledge for a symposium featuring Ruth Okedeji's work on on traditional knowledge. Uh, and the other is a case study looking at South Africa's protection for traditional knowledge. And as I was working on both of them, um, this idea uh, came to me. So I, I'm, I'm putting it together um, here really for the first time. So um, as Peter mentioned, I do a lot of work uh, at WIPO um, in the IGC. And Traditional knowledge or the protection of traditional knowledge is a pretty contentious issue. It's been under discussion at WIPO for almost 20 years now in the IGC with no clear end in sight, um, put it that way. And, and there are three different texts that are being negotiated and two kinds of protection, at least for traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions, are being put forward. Positive protection, which is really protection, and defensive protection, which um, is a bit of a misnomer and may be actually misleading some negotiators, some policymakers, in a way that it could ultimately be detrimental to IPLCs. And the, all three of the texts that are being uh, discussed have provisions for defensive or complementary protection, which is really um, another word for databases, putting traditional knowledge in databases um, in order to protect it. And there are some delegations that are putting forward this rhetoric time and time and time again. And I went back and looked at some of the reports and they're saying the same thing over and over and over again about how databases um, could be a great and way to protect traditional knowledge and can provide uh, ensure the appropriate t protection of traditional knowledge by preventing the grant of erroneous patents. And um, they also have put forward, at least a few countries put forward, and it's kind of hard to see, but this joint recommendation, um, there it is, this joint recommendation that was submitted by four different delegations on establishing a WIPO portal for traditional knowledge uh, that patent examiners would have access to and how this would be so great and there would be very little chance of the traditional knowledge leaking out because an examiner would only have to point to the knowledge in the database 
and that would be it. And I'm like, that's just not true. It's just not true. Um, and, and yet, if you're not very familiar with the way patent examination works, that may sound fine. And I've actually talked to delegates there who are talking about putting these kinds of database systems together, or actually implementing them in their countries. I'm like, well, have you thought about how this is actually going to work and that this information is actually going to be public? And they're like, no. So I'm like, okay, probably need to write something about this. Um, and something that has aided these discussions is the way that India for many years now has touted its traditional knowledge uh, digital library and how successful it has been in preventing the grant of erroneous patents um, in a number of different IP offices around the world. And uh, they've got statistics on um, cases where this knowledge was submitted and resulted in the invalidation of patents or, or preventing the grant of patents. Um, the success record has been critiqued and uh, there are a variety of um, uh, researchers who've looked a little more closely at some of these allegations and I'm like, no, that's not, um, all of these are not actually cases where information from the TKDL really did result in the patent not being um, granted, but nevertheless, um, that's what's been said and that's also encouraging countries to look at and consider um, putting together these databases. But if you have this knowledge in a database, it's not protected. Um, it's not, it can still be freely used, even if it's not patented, um, it can still be freely used by third parties and if you prevent the patent, you still can't stop that patent applicant from using it in the absence of positive protection. And third parties cannot directly access these databases, but any of the records that are cited by an examiner during the examination process are gonna be put in the file history and then the public's going to have access to them. Um, and I know this because uh, I've actually pulled up some of these documents. Um, and moreover, you're providing this information that's in the database to the people who are most likely to be able to make use of it and expand on it or design around it. Um, I have a quote here from uh, someone on the IPCAP blog who is actually from India, and he was saying this actually could facilitate biopiracy because this information is not going to be secret. Um, I have a couple examples here, and you can't see it very well, but there was a patent application filed by Centalis Healthcare dealing with they, claims to um, relating to the use of sandalwood and curing various types of um, cancer. And a number of TKDL references were cited. This was in a U.S. patent application. And uh, you can't see it, but the TKDL references, they talk about the use for the treatment of cancer, um, and they have a lot of other ingredients as well. And so that's another thing about putting the traditional knowledge in a database. When it's cited to a patent applicant, that patent applicant is gonna see a lot more than what they're just claiming. And there may be other kinds of compounds that they had not considered exploring for the treatment of a particular condition. So you're, you're actually making this available, not just to the applicant, but anyone who, like me, wants to go into the file history. Um, if there is any challenge, if there's an appeal of this decision, it would go to the court and the United States, it could go all the way up to the Supreme Court and it's totally available to the public. Um, and this was a case in the EPO. Um, Avon was seeking a patent application on wrinkle, re wrinkle reduction methods and some traditional now TKDL references were cited against it and they were able to modify their claims and still get um, the patent allowed and that's, that's generally what happens. So I've been thinking about a better way as I've been exploring, for example, South Africa's system and I just wanted to highlight a couple of features. It's not perfect, it's not even fully uh, implemented yet, but they're, they're providing um, or seeking to provide positive protection, true rights in relation to the traditional knowledge in addition to database um, protection for the TK. So I'm, I'm not gonna go through all of this, but these are a lot of the features of the traditional knowledge. One of the things I find really interesting are the license provisions that if you license traditional knowledge from an IPLC for something that is information that could be patentable, 
um, you only have to pay royalties for um, 20 years, basically, the term of a patent, and for something that's more like a TCE that might be protected by copyright, then for 50 years, um, and after that, you wouldn't have to pay royalties anymore. The TK is still protected if some other person wanted to use it, um, but the royalties in, and that's something that detractors have been concerned about, is like, do I have to pay forever for the use of this? No, not necessarily. Um, and the Department of Science and Technology in South Africa, they did benchmarking, and they point out that their approach, this national record system, provides defensive and positive protection as opposed to the TKDL with just positive, I'm sorry, just defensive protection. Um, they have different levels of access for the TK in the database. So in addition to legislation that would provide positive rights um, for the um, IPLCs to say who can use it, um, they also can specify um, the level of secrecy for the information that's put in the database. And it's not only about preventing against patents. Patent examiners can access it, but it's also about recording it and preserving it, and it's done contextually with videos and audios of the actual traditional knowledge holders. And as um, Jeremy mentioned, this is dynamic information. It's not traditional refers to the way in which it's created in this communal context, not that it's necessarily very old. So there can be a lot of innovations going on in this space. And combining the interviews, they're going around and interviewing, collecting that information, combining it with scientific published data that may already be known in this database that is really very useful, interactive. I think it has a lot of potential. Um, and the benefits for the communities can be significant in terms of in economic development. I have a couple of examples of um, uh, initiatives where traditional knowledge holders approached the um, CSIR in South Africa, and the CSIR researchers um, actually did research, confirmed the benefits of the particular plants. This one relates to an insect repellent. It's apparently great for repelling mosquitoes, so you can light these candles, and actually help the community. They, they obtained patent protection, helped them find an industry partner, um, provided jobs for the community, and, and also tech transfer, because the community members are involved in all of the aspects of the um, the manufacturing of these candles, as well as they also get a percentage of royalties um, in relation to the patent. So it's a blending of um, TK uh, protection as sui generis regime, but also taking advantage of the patent system when you make modifications um, to the traditional knowledge and getting protection for that that can also benefit the community. Um, another example is uh, this plant that contains monotin, a non-caloric sweetener. Um, again, this information was given to CSIR. They confirmed the benefits. They negotiated a license agreement with um, U.S. multinational Cargill, and royalties have already been paid to these uh, communities, a percentage that CSIR negotiated. So it's a way of having economic development, but you're not going to get it just with defensive protection, putting information in a database that may or may not stop one, someone from getting a patent on it, but certainly is not going to stop someone from using it um, or necessarily designing around it. So um, if you want to actually protect traditional knowledge, and there, it's a complicated area, and figuring out how to do it right is, is no simple thing. I think there are a lot of positive um, aspects to the approach that South Africa has taken, but um, not defensive elect protection alone, and it's not even really protection, is not sufficient. It, it does make the information more accessible, and if the goal is only to reduce the possibility of the IPLCs having to challenge a patent after it's granted, sure, that's beneficial, but it's not protection. Um, and instead, um, providing positive protection creates the opportunity for economic development benefits as well. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Good morning. Is this on? Okay. Good morning. Okay. I hope it's a good morning. Um, let me just uh, join the 
chorus of thank yous to Peter. Um, very few people can bring me to DC. And I'd say maybe two people could bring me to DC, God and then Peter Yazzie. <laughs> so thank you to Peter. Um, this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. And so I, I just want to start by thanking all the other panelists who have put a lot of work and thought into this intersection um, to advance what I think is really a compelling um, obligation for our generation of IP scholars, um, old or young, whatever we call ourselves, I think that it's important. So I wanna say th probably three main things. Um, they may or may not be easy to uh, reconcile, but um, they all, I think, point towards the same end. When we think about the role of intellectual property in development, I, I think there are two framing questions. Um, as Maggie uh, mentioned, often we look at the experience of the United States, we look at, at Europe, um, and, and the assumption, even though it's not often explicitly stated, is, well, it, it worked. In fact, the legitimacy of the intellectual property system is based on this notion that it worked. It, it worked for the US, and it worked for Europe. And so if it's not working in South America, if it's not working in Africa, if it's not working in Asia, it's because there's something wrong with those countries. Um, and then in the modern uh, landscape of the debate, uh, the question tends to be, well, how can we improve it? And so I want to submit first that, that we have been part of the problem, that there has not been an effective decoupling of what intellectual property does and what development is for. That's my first big point. Um, so since the 1960s, the idea of development goals and aspirations has provided powerful rhetoric. And, and, and I don't wanna underestimate how powerful that rhetoric has been. That rhetoric has shaped institutional and political strategies for encouraging countries to join in the IP system. It has um, shaped a full suite of national IP laws um, patents, copyright, trademarks. It has created an entire new industry where none existed. We have a cadre of IP lawyers. Um, everyone wants to study IP. Everyone is studying IP, new certification programs, new LLMs. I mean, there's an entire cottage industry built around intellectual property that has, in effect, legitimized IP. Despite the deep and ongoing concern about the structural and normative challenges that IP poses for development. And last but not least, one of my, many of you who know me know that I'm a person of faith and there's one of my favorite scriptures is that uh, faith comes by hearing. And this is um, something that we are witnessing in the global south, that having heard the IP narrative and heard it over and over and over again, and having seen the short-term economic benefits that come when you are um, compliant, at least on the surface, with implementing laws that look just like what worked for the US and just like what worked for Europe, um, that there are short-term benefits to it. And so we have created a, a system in which developing countries have become um, essentially a hostage to capacity building. And capacity building or training programs has been an outflow of this rhetoric that has conditioned many countries in the global south to demand formal assurances of technical assistance in exchange for ever-growing uh, types of IP treaties. And so rather than emancipating countries from the global IP regime, um, we have created a sense of entitlement to be participants in that IP regime, and the price for that participation is technical assistance. So despite enduring debates about the relationship of IP and economic development, that relationship is actually not much better understood today than it was more than 50, 60 years ago at the height of the independence era. What does it mean to actually say that copyright advances development? I mean, why do development indicators in so many countries reflect poorly in the very areas that are supposed to be strengthened, for example, by copyright or by patent law? 
such as promoting democratic governance. If you do the charts for the most um, repressive countries and the strongest IP laws, you will see a correlation. What about this idea of a robust, uh, a robust um, marketplace of ideas? Where do we see that actually happening outside of cyberspace, Twitter, and Facebook? Where do we see the rates of formal educational attainment and literacy? So in the very areas that we, at least on paper in the literature, think about IP as promoting development, we in fact see the opposite. And I would suggest that scholars and policymakers and advocacy organizations need to have a clearer sense of what it is about patents and what it is about copyright that actually matters for development. And we need to have a better sense of why it matters and how it matters. And, and if it's true that appropriately designed copyright laws really have the potential to deliver on these development goals, then what kinds of legislative and policy choices will make that happen? So I, my, my second concern and big point is that because we have not decoupled what IP does from what development is supposed to do, we have proposed answers that solve neither copyright's greatest sicknesses nor development's greatest needs. We've proposed limitations and exceptions that I still believe in firmly, but limitations and exceptions such as we have delineated them and identified them do not in fact advance development. They advance human flourishing where they are allowed to actually take root. But the structural macroeconomic institution building gains that are supposed to come from development are not fostered by the kinds of limitations and exceptions that we have tended to support. And I think that leads me to a third fundamental point, and that is that we cannot do global development the way in which we have done international IP. The global development doesn't emerge because we have the best set of intellectual property treaties or even the best set of limitations and exceptions. That what makes national economic development possible is a mix of state policies and resource endowments that over time produce political and economic and social improvements that are scalable. That we're not creating an elite that can consume cultural goods. What we want to do with development is to spread the creation and the access of and to cultural goods so that the human flourishing capacity of the vast majorities of people can continue to increase. So what does that mean for our IP and development narrative? First, I think that appeals to development in international copyright circles in particular um, need to be held accountable to what is meant precisely by that term. It's, it's a malleable term, as Maggie has mentioned. The challenge is that intellectual property bureaucracies in developing and least developed countries tend to be uh, the ones that are most likely to embrace the IP and development narrative that we have postulated for the last 50 years and the least likely to question them. Why? Because they have been the most benefited by the training and capacity programs. These training and capacity programs that we all have tended to be skeptical about have worked. They've created the very bureaucracies that continue to um, insist that the only path to development requires maximum property rights in knowledge goods. And oftentimes, these local intellectual property bureaucracies advance the theory of IP and development more forcefully than any of their counterparts in the developed world. Even if copyright's vision of progress accurately portrays the role of authors in liberal societies, that vision is still inadequate to justify the existing international copyright framework. These international minimum standards um, are not culturally neutral. They are not scientifically derived. The rules don't tell us how authors may choose to express themselves in different institutional and cultural settings. Neither do, us, do they tell us what the content of their works will be but they do define important terms and conditions, and they do define the way in which we think about human flourishing in every society. And so I suggest that one of the things that we must do is identify the kinds of normative barriers that make it difficult to scale the benefits of economic growth 
when it comes to access to cultural goods. I think that one of the key things that struck me is, is a senior leader in a developing country looking me dead in the eye and saying, well, what does copyright do exactly? Why should I spend X amount of my budget on developing a copyright regime or in fighting about limitations and exceptions? These NGOs, these authors groups are banging on my door and I have no idea what they are doing or what they are talking about. The level of dissonance between policymakers in developing countries and the literature and the advocacy and the solutions that we are proposing is remarkable. After more than 25 years of trips, there are still a great number of policymakers who do not understand the relationship between limitations and exceptions in development or even between protection and development. That means we have not done the job that we think we've done. That we've read each other's works, we've, we've marched, we've, we've, we've funded, uh, we have written amazing works of scholarship, and it appears not to be making a dent where it needs to. I think it's important to do two things. First, there's no question in my mind that we have to redesign the international IP system. And that redesign is not a treaty redesign, it's a structural redesign. I, I think that we have dodged and fought and advocated in the shadows of an international agency that does not know how to remake itself because the only model that exists is a model that says we must have rights and then let's fight about limitations and exceptions or let's fight about alternative models. And so I suggest that we must begin to think about how we redesign WIPO. Not just WIPO's treaties, not just WIPO's norms, not just its norm setting processes, but the very structure of the organization. Until we tackle that mammoth challenge, we will continue to produce treaties, norms, and processes that reproduce themselves. It's like contagion. Once the model exists and is released through capacity training and through mimicking of theories that have no reality to human flourishing on the ground, we will continue to face the resistance that we have seen for the last century plus. So what can we do on scale? Let me just conclude with a couple of modest suggestions and hopefully um, those of you in the audience have much more to contribute to this. First, I think the moment for reorganizing WIPO is right because so much of our copyright and innovation debates are in areas that WIPO actually doesn't exercise jurisdiction. When we think about the digital infrastructure and the digital delivery of content and the way in which innovation actually is taking place in the development and dissemination of cultural goods, this is an area that WIPO has targeted as something it wants to begin to look at. But there are no, I mean, you know, the WCT and WPPT are just laughable, right? They don't really do much for the economy um, and for the content of, of digitization that we have today. What can we do to begin to reorient norms of copyright, norms of welfare, norms of public interest, norms of development around the kinds of inclusion and openness themes that Jeremy and some of the other panelists have raised today? Because we don't have an excuse in that space. We can't say that there are golden age treaties that whose legitimacy we have to come against and they are Goliaths and we are Davids. And actually that would be good because I think David won that battle. But the point is we have space in which the sort of blue sky ideas that, that Peter has invited us to think about today ought to be taken seriously. I've raised in a recent paper what would happen if we fused the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, with WIPO? How about giving that organization some hemp and thinking about ways in which we can structurally begin to reshape the production process for the norms that govern knowledge in a digital financial economy? The second thing that I think is gonna be really important is strict enforcement of copyrights boundaries in a local context. It's amazing that the idea expression distinction, which I think is one of the most important limitations in the copyright realm, um, really has not shown up as clearly as it ought to in the national implementation of TRIPS or in any of the other 
copyright treaties that we have seen. Since copyright legislation in developing and least developed countries is rarely drafted by local experts, it always involves direction and commentary from international experts, it's important that we begin to ask ourselves why we are not seeing much more clear enforcement of copyrights boundaries in these local statutes. And so rather than being magnanimous and empathetic to the many challenges the developing country governments face, it's time to begin to demand some accountability. Because for the norms that already exist to facilitate scalable human flourishing, we are not seeing those norms being advanced in as clear and unequivocal terms as they absolutely need to be. The second modest proposal will be the harmonization of the education exception. The whole point of development is to scale up human capacity. You cannot do that with an uneducated society. And I would submit that one of the reasons the dissonance and the gaps between intellectual property and development has been so remarkable is because in fact, we have not delivered on the promise of enabling citizens to become citizens, enabling communities to be, to be participants in political and cultural dialogue. And so when, when women and, and young girls don't have access to education, when generations upon generations of communities, and I mean communities even in the United States, are not going to college, are not going to school, are not completing elementary school, it's telling us that a system that we've devised to produce innovation and to promote civic discourse and to enable freedom of expression, that this system is broken. It's working for a few, it is not working for many. And if it's not working for all in the global north, you know that it will not work for most in the global south. We must harmonize the education exception. And last, I think we have to think of ways to maximize the use of cultural goods for human capital formation. Because at the heart of development theory is human capital. Every economist in the room knows this, that the diffusion of knowledge is critical to ensure this dynamic interplay between the public domain and the production and introduction of new goods in society. Jessica Lipman says it so beautifully and so simply. And the most important reason that we have copyright, that we have books, is because authors want to create and communicate new works in the hopes that people will read them. In the hopes that people will read them. People write their music, sing their songs, in the hopes that people will listen to that music. They'll see the art, they'll watch the films, they'll run the software, they'll build and inhabit the buildings. That is the way the copyright promotes progress. People are reading, people are learning, people are doing. They're enabled to do that. And so limitations and exceptions become important, but be they become important not just on the books. They not only have to become exceptions, they have to become embedded into the very architecture of the legal systems that say we want to promote progress and that we want to promote development. And lastly, then, these must be paired with mandatory exceptions and limitations. So there ought to be a corpus. I don't care if it's one, two, three, or four, but there must be a minimum standards of mandatory carve-outs from the copyright system that every country must commit to. And in particular, I think I saw Teresa somewhere in the room, but my librarian friends will, will know this, in particular for libraries. Whatever libraries will look like in the future, whatever they are becoming today, we need a public institution that enables access for most in every sphere of the world. Copyright regimes that operate to hinder the collection of knowledge goods by libraries, that operate to hinder the dissemination of those works by libraries and archives, are regimes that need to be targeted as ultimately violative of the fundamental dignities that development is meant to confer on human societies. Let me just end by saying this. 
In a recent work, I talked about reframing the international IP system for development. And I built on something Bernd Hugenholtz and I um, wrote some years ago um, when we concluded that there had to be a global instrument for limitations and exceptions, and there had to be a global regulation of this tertium quid, this area of IP law that is neither a right nor a privilege. We have to put definition and content to it, and we need to do it because we have to facilitate transborder exchanges, because we have to address the institutional weaknesses of states that do not have the capacity to respond by building norms and processes to counteract the strong propertization that we continue to see. And last but not least, we have to do it because while we can fight public institutions or organizations that promote rights that are stronger than might be ideal for development, it becomes increasingly difficult to do it when the resolution of rights debates becomes embedded in technologies like artificial intelligence, when they become embedded behind the black walls of private dispute settlements as we see happening on the major platforms today that virtually you are seeing a growth in the resolution of IP disputes, not in courts, not through legislation, you're seeing them in these dispute mechanisms that are happening on the platforms where so much of IP is lived and is lost. So if we're gonna be serious about what IP is supposed to do for development, and not just development in the global south, because I think we sometimes think of it as a global south problem, it's about human development. And if it's going to work for the global south as it has worked historically for the global north, we need to begin to reconvene a discourse that is not around the inalienability or the um, unavoidability of the existing regimes. We need to be willing to challenge its foundations, its structures, and its outcomes. Thank you. Well, it, as you've seen, this has been a, a remarkable set of interventions, and it is a remarkable set of, of individuals who have given them, uh, not not necessarily senior, but all at the very the very height of their their power and powers and, and influence. So thank you very much. We have a little time left, not not as much as I would hope, but I think that it might be a good idea to go directly to taking a few questions from the audience. Let me invite the the panelists to come up again if they would like. Irene, perhaps you can you can uh, call on and 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 moderate this discussion. And I new name tag. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you to all the speakers that really made our uh, morning. Uh, very interesting, uh, and they give us a lot of food for thought. Um, I would like um, to get questions from the audience, but before, I would like to give some keywords that I have uh, taken from, uh, um, from each of the presentation. There is a theme, a recurrent theme here that I think it's really important about um, inclusion rather than just a uh, free flow of information or Openness. I think you know Jeremy started uh, with these two keywords. In my view, inclusiveness and nuanced approach. Um, something that um, some other scholar have defined as uh, no one size fits all. Uh, and I think that it's something that in his attempt, I really enjoy Ruth's presentation. Um, I am less idealist at this point, working a lot with the big organization. Uh, um, but uh, we do need not to relent. I think that's really important in our, in our mission in trying to really redesign this system for true human flourishing, pursuit of happiness, uh, and, uh, and um, you know, in development for all, not just for the South, but for all. Um, 
Uh, in uh, the other presentation, I think some of the other keywords I would uh, highlight is um, concentration of power. We really see the 1% of intellectual property owners own it all. And uh, then going to what Jerry was mentioning, uh, the problem of access and redistribution. These are current themes, but they remain the crucial themes. Then how we define access, how we redistribute, how we are inclusive within a nuanced approach in redesigning and rethinking, I think, remains crucial. Um, and of course, you know, social justice um, does remain our main goal and public interest as this Congress um, wants to be uh, the theme within, you know, the intellectual property framework. Uh, and so with that, without further ado, I would like to open to the audience to get a few, a few questions. If you could be so kind to uh, introduce yourself, see who you are, and keep your question brief, uh, that would be most, uh, most desirable. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, it's wonderful panel, great ideas, and we all agree that the system is not working you know, for development of what you know, people need. And we have great ideas that we should change the system. And especially, I like the idea of Ruth, like how we change WIPO. But, but the, the problem is that the, the system is not working not only in IP, but in also in different systems, in a banking system, you know, and food delivery and everything. So it seems that the, the problem is not these institutions or not the policies, just how power is held in society today. So my question is, how are we going to deal with the, the fact that it's the people who has the power, you know, is how are we going to, to change that? You know, because I, I don't see how, but I, I'd love to see how, what's the plan to, to, to get into the, the, the real issue. Oh, shall we get a few more questions? Any more questions? Um, perhaps uh, we collect them and then the panelists will get, since we have scarcity of time, uh, everybody will get an opportunity to respond. Please, if you can introduce yourself as well. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Aman Gebru. I teach at Cardozo Law School. Um, I'm trying to think through three of their presentations and see if I can tie them together. So if I can borrow Jerry's you know, suggestion for pooling resources together and the two topics that Margot and Ruth kind of touched on, the traditional knowledge and um, uh, reorganizing the Global South, to um, you know, push back against this um, increasing harmonization of uh, and maximi maximization of intellectual property rights. Uh, why haven't we seen um, you know an organization, say in Africa or Latin America or Asia, that um, represents the values and the interests of uh, the countries or the people that live in those countries? Uh, for example, in Africa, we have different intellectual property organizations that uh, claim to represent the continent. But I think the priorities are not necessarily in line with the interests of the people that live in that continent. So, um, you know, at least Margot and Ruth, I know you work with uh, leaders in those countries. So what, why hasn't there been a success in terms of leaders of those countries saying, you know, let's involve ourselves in global discussions, but let's say have an intellectual property organization in Africa that represents um, the interest of the people that live there, and then use that to reform WIPO or other countries and conversations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Any more questions? Please, Katya. Uh, uh, hello, my, I'm Katja Wekström Lindros from University of Eastern Finland, uh, and I have a question that is directed at Margaret and also Ruth. You talked about uh, development and, and the mainly emphasizing the North as being also, this is not just an issue of, of the Global South. And uh, I like the idea of, of, of working about uh, changing WIPO, but uh, what about the change that should be done in the North in terms of, of advancing uh, these issues of development? Why aren't we really activating ourselves uh, in the North? Because we know how, how well we are at replicating models that happen in the North. Uh, wouldn't that be a solution or, or what, be, what would be your thoughts uh, on that, what we can do in the North? Please. My name is Rami Olwan, uh, and I'm an IP scholar from the Middle East. I want to ask the panelists, distinguished panelists, about the WIPO development agenda, especially 
what they think about uh, the implementation of the WIPO development agenda within WIPO. Do they have any kind of criticism? Because there's lots of scholarship about uh, WIPO development agenda and it's not doing what it should do. I want to know their views in relation to the WIPO development agenda, if they have any criticism and how WIPO should take or rethink its whole WIPO development agenda in the future. Thank you. Any more questions? So perhaps we give all the panelists, uh, starting from Jerry, uh, the opportunity to respond, either targeted question or general comments. Put, 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 put the microphone. To the other, some of the questions put to Ruth and uh, Margot. Uh, on the WIPO development agenda, I, I've got an article coming out that discusses that. Uh, its importance was that it uh, outlined 45 important areas that uh, were previously neglected and needed to be taken into consideration. And that has led to a lot more discussion of a lot more uh, areas of interest to developing countries. Uh, um, how you go beyond that is another matter, and I, I think <laughs> that would require a good deal of a reorganization of WIPO and reframing of WIPO, uh, uh, where the obviously the power of the developed countries is way over, uh, 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 is way is way too strong, and not others. But that's a, another topic. I did want to mention uh, a couple of other uh, thoughts that occurred to me. First of all, when we think of um, uh, what is intellectual property law? We, we need to expand our boundaries even further because uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, innovations in intellectual property is that we are now protecting inputs, not just outputs, final yeah. products. And that is not just a developed country phenomenon, it's a developing country phenomenon because since 1992 we have the Convention on Biological Diversity and we are regulating inputs and we are demanding a share of the rewards from output. And it's not just a developing country thing because if you think about it, the, uh, uh, the uh, database directive in the EU was one of the first of these uh, uh, strange uh, uh, attempts to protect uh, inputs rather than outputs. So this needs a lot more uh, study. Secondly, uh, we hear a lot of uh, important calls for open science and uh, open uh, networks, and I, I thoroughly subscribe to all of that. Uh, uh, but I want to add a, a second dimension to that that is uh, under, uh, underdeveloped. We, we are writing an article about uh, uh, access to data at a big conference in Africa coming up. But um, commons are wonderful, but they aren't the only approach because semi-commons are also very important. Communities that work together, uh, that pool their data, they have access to this, uh, all of this pooled data, and eventually those can become commons. So it's very important not to lose sight of the, of the role that semi-commons play. And finally, one, one point I call your attention, there's a brilliant study uh, coming out of the University of Haifa in Israel, uh, and I, 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 I reviewed this for, uh, uh, promotion, but I, I'm sorry, I, I just don't have the author's name with me, but it's a wonderful study, eco law and economic study of uh, patents. And one of the most uh, astounding findings is that here we have the global north, the global south, we keep talking about that. He says, well, let's look at the global north. And he says, about half the countries in the global north that are always screaming, give us more patent protection, have almost no patent filings whatsoever. They are absolutely no players in the patent and they have no benefits. But if we turn to the global south, no more patents, no more intellectual property, a growing number of these people, in the, these countries in the growing south have an intense amount of patent filings and it's growing all the time and they are really benefiting from it. So he says this, he, I think he really demonstrates that this global north, global south distinction is really obsolete yes. and we only are going to start thinking more clearly about it when we redefine the real boundaries of what's going on there and really get down to the really interests of people in different countries and not this global north global south thing I leave it there thank you thank you very much Margo snap very short very short um, everybody else very short. all right so I just want to address two of the points um, to the question of what can the north uh, do it's 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 a challenge when industry is controlling the positions of 
uh, the government <laughs> in its negotiations, as <laughs> yeah. Susan yeah. Uh, has, has written about <laughs> quite well. So um, uh, I don't know. Uh, and in terms of the, uh, Peter Drahos calls it patent office schizophrenia. Um, where you have the patent office that has diametrically opposed objectives to the public that it's supposed to be serving, um, either because it's it's funded by fees from um, patent applicants and they're generally foreign applicants who are, are, are doing that. And with the connection with WIPO and the assistance that WIPO provides um, for these regional offices in, in Africa, there is a real disconnect um, and know that it, between what is best for Africa and what is best for the patent organizations and where their interests are aligned. And when you say, well, you know, why, why don't the leaders of the different countries take over? Well, they are not IP experts. The experts are in the IP office. That's who they're relying on to help them develop the policies and approaches. So it's, you know, it's it's a very dysfunctional system. I remember, I will never forget being at a conference, just very briefly, I'm in this country and speaking with the head of a new IP office. She was a political appointee. Um, she was talking about this great assistance that WIPO's giving. And I was asking, you know, you know, is their system automated? Are, are their applications published? She's like, oh no, um, the, the patent owners don't want them published. I'm like, wait, what? Is and so, you know, there's there's this this problem when you have folks who do not necessarily um, understand what their role is or what the public interest is, and they have different incentives and are rewarded differently from um, what would be best for society as a whole. So, I have a flight, so I have all the incentive to speak very fast. You're just going to have to listen very fast. Um, I think that. For, for those of us in this room where obviously we're studying this, we're advocating, um, there are two things. We need to distinguish between work that goes toward a, an ideal IP policy, an ideal copyright patent trademark policy in the abstract, um, and work that goes towards redressing the imbalance that the current system has, which is a development problem. So I think that's going to be a useful way to track the work um, much, more, much better, and it also helps us benchmark um, accomplishments. Um, the development agenda is extremely problematic. I remember um, one of the main architects um, at the morning after it passed saying, looked at me and said, do you think we just made the worst mistake ever? And I said, yes. Um, because it, it just legitimized the institution and all that it does in ways that we will never be able to sort of pull back on. It also embeds impossible outcomes um, into what WIPO does. And so a lot of this is, in fact, I feel very badly. I'd rather fight the fight about rights than fight the fight about the development agenda because what you're seeing is a lot of money poured into so-called development activities that everybody in the room knows does nothing, for one thing, um, and in fact is anti-development, as anti-development as anti-development can get. Um, there has not been enough work on the organizational bureaucracy um, of WIPO. The fact that we don't know how these decisions are made. There are lists of experts that nobody really knows. There are people that are persona non grata. I mean, there are all, the, all these things. There's just no accountability. So a simple institutional um, mechanism to, to insist on accountability would be an amazing um, corrector of bad behavior and at least give us data that can help us better understand what's happening and why it's happening. Lewis makes the point that, well, this is a problem everywhere, you know, power and non-power. And I think that's true, but frankly, if we stayed there, um, we may have well have never had civil rights, we may have well have never, you know, had independence. I mean, there's so many things we would never do if we only stopped at the, at the recognition that there's power to be had. A couple of ideas that I have about about dealing with this. So the transparency, you know, power hates to be open. Like nobody likes to say I'm powerful. Everybody wants to be non-powerful, exercising power behind the veil. So transparency is huge. So what kinds of things can be done to improve transparency? This is a huge thing. And let me say, by the way, not just transparency on WIPO's side, transparency at the national governmental side. I have a paper coming out in which I am extremely critical of uh, countries in the global south because the governments have been just as problematic as the governments of the global north. Um, and so I think we need to think about how we do that. Um, I would throw a bomb into a repo and OAPI and blow them all up. <laughs> 
um, for not for about a, people, not then. killing people, <laughs> just just the organization, and not even a literal bomb, but lots of paper bombs, right? Um, I think what we really should think about doing is a convening around this question of intellectual property administration. We tend to focus so much on the norms, the exceptions, da da da. da. The administration is where the action is, and if we don't fix that administration, it doesn't matter what the paper documents look like. And I think nobody has done that. That is going to send chills down every bureaucratic spine that you know, right? Just having a conference saying, we want to talk about getting rid of you, <laughs> right? That's all you need to do. The last thing is alternatives. We need to have functional alternatives, and this may mean that we have to engage platforms, um, private actors that play in the IP space and actually have a lot of power in the IP space, um, but are often not the target of advocacy. So those are some ideas about diluting power, changing the, 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 the landscape, and getting rid of the development agenda. Thank you. Maggie. I hope she makes her flight. Okay. Um, so I wanted to address Luis's um, provocation because I, I think Susan can speak much better to this, but as I was listening to Susan, I was thinking she could come up with a great term for this, like you know, uber neoliberalism or something like that, because it's really beyond what we've really been dealing with, what, what we're seeing now. Um, some people are addressing this fourth industrial revolution, which includes this concentration of wealth and power in an unparalleled way, because it's about information as, as the new currency, right? And it's being um, sort of uh, managed by these sort of um, monopolistic or uh, oligopolistic um, platforms, in, in fact. Um, I won't name names, but um, I think we know some of whom we're talking, who we're talking about. Um, I didn't mention the sustainable development goals. So that is uh, something that actually is trying to disrupt this idea of north versus south. And very explicitly says that this is a development, a de de these development goals are for everybody. And that we don't want to continue to reinforce this false dichotomy between the less developed and the more developed. Whether or not that plays out well, on the ground is another question, but at least that's the ideology. So. Okay, I'm gonna be really quick. Um, first of all, I'm thinking, of in, I study governance as a political scientist, and one thing that I see is everywhere is multi-level governance now. And just like Jamie Boyle talked about the environmentalism of the net a long time ago, political scientists who are working on environmental politics are really at the cutting edge of understanding multi-level governance and looking at the local level and everywhere in between because things were frozen for so long at the multilateral level. And they haven't sat, you know, nobody's been sitting still. And so there's a lot of really interesting governance experiments at multiple levels. And I think that's one place that we should be busy at every level possible in terms of trying to change these because you can't change the structure overnight. In terms of power, I think the successful campaigns for access and whatnot have been successful when they partnered with a market actor. And all companies are not the same. All financial firms, all hedge funds are not the same. Um, I just came back from um, Columbia's Center for Sustainable Investment where we were launching the book. And I was approached by a lot of people who are involved in the social investing space. And they said more and more customers are coming to them and saying, I want socially responsible investment. So there's a lot of potential partners out there that do have power. And that power is growing as people change their minds about things. And I'm going to just leave it there. I'd also like to address the power question. Um, and I think that part of the challenge um, is recognizing that uh, we actually have quite a lot of power in this community and in, in our networks. And trying to find ways to harness that collectively so that we're all pulling the rope in the same direction. I think that this is a great forum where we can start doing that. Um, Ruth's comments have really made me think or rethink my position on the development agenda um, because although I don't think it's been nearly as successful or effective as uh, it needs to have been or, or could have been, there has been significant, um, maybe I shouldn't use the word significant, there have been some changes. And I think you have to slow the train down before you can turn it around. And if you look at the discourse at WIPO around the turn of the century, it's significantly different now. Like Jerry says, there are a lot of issues on the agenda that, that weren't there before. Now, there's still a long way to go, there's still a lot of work to do. Um, but in, in doing that, I, I personally am an advocate of the Trojan horse strategy. I think that um, 
through our network, when we can um, use our, our powerful positions, whether it's because we've got research funding or fancy titles or, you know, or research chairs or whatever it is, um, to get into those fora and to affect change from, from the inside. And um, that's something I think some of us have been doing with WIPO and technical capacity building and technical assistance, um, getting on the agenda and then saying things they didn't expect or, or working, you know, um, maybe across purposes from some of the organizations. Uh, in another area that we've been doing that, just to wrap up by addressing Aman's question, is, is um, on the African continent with the um, continental free trade area. So there are a few of us who have been working, Caroline and Tobias and Chidi and I have been trying to shape the discourse around their IP chapter um, from the inside. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's I think one of the strategies that, that we try to adopt and there's lots of work to do, but I'm optimistic. Um, and with that, you know, if I can uh, use for a second the preg preg prerogative of the moderator, I disclose I'm a WIPO expert. I'm actually work very closely with them. And uh, I actually buy, I am actually very much in favor of this Trojan or strategy. We work with them. I organize conferences and I have the full blank check support and really we can shape the way we want. Um, and that's really, you know, incremental step. But we have been doing a lot of, lot of uh, uh, I would say good work in Asia with work in progress, empowering scholars to talk about anything they want with zero control on content, to be fully honest. Um, and, uh, and, you know, my last remark is, some, you know, we need to think about the IP infrastructure, but beyond that, I work a lot with Cambodia, and Cambodia now has all the treatises, but they have 19 patents. So in theory, they could copy everything they want, but they don't have the infrastructure. They say many of African countries, they really have almost zero patent, but even the transfer of technology will not work because the capacity in copying is not there. So they don't have the industries, even though they don't have, you know, they have the treaty, but they don't really have the patent register. They cannot produce, not because of law, legal barriers, but because of infrastructure, actual manufacturing barriers. So when we think about development, the law to me often is the last stage. There is so much more in terms of capacity in infrastructure, in manufacturing, in resources that many of these discourse on development could involve. So it's not just IP, it's IP and, and much more, I would say. Um, so I think that's some food for thought that we lawyer or activists need to take with, with us about how we can help really building the bread and butter then, and then we can talk about, about the law because, because often that's really what's missing is that, that part. So without that, I would like to uh, give the final word to Professor Peter Jazzy, who is really the soul of this panel and the soul of his, of, you know, of his enterprise to conclude. Well, th this was, this was I, I think we got a, a very, very Sitting down? Where are you going?